Welcome back to Bombastic Nation, a ting, and ting, and ting. I'm Mr. Giant, and I'm back with some more vibes for all you. And uh, I do read my comments. <laughs> May not seem like it sometimes, but I do. And uh, someone suggested that I watch Geography Now Somalia. And Somalia is one of the uh, countries that I, uh, I reacted to earlier on when I started doing these reactions. Uh, pretty intrigued by it. And uh, we're going to go ahead and see what go on here, what uh, Geography Now have to say about Somalia. Let's YouTube and Sim Simmer. You can get them at unityshirtshop.com. Thank you, Ruba. Somalia. Now, this is an interesting one. For those of you that follow this show, you'll remember that one time way back when Caleb and I went to Hargeisa for our first geography in Africa. So, depending on which kind of a Somali person you encounter, one might say we technically visited Somalia, and another will say, no, we did not. Either way, it was one of the most memorable moments of my life. Hey, Caleb. Yeah. Yeah, what did you think of, uh, you know, Hargeisa? Yeah, the one thing I, I realized about uh, when I reacted to Somalia, there were different people saying different things as to where Somalia is. And uh, I think there's a difference between Somalia and Somaliland, and there's difference in the people and stuff like that. If I'm not mistaken, that's what... Uh, there was a lot of uh, discourse about that in the comments section. But let's keep going here. So when we went there, we had a great time. I, my experience was, I think there's a Western misconception that Somalia, Somaliland is like this crazy, dangerous place. And I actually felt very safe while I was there. We saw sunken ships and all that. We did those um, paintings on the walls. Cave paintings, yeah. Uh, really glad you came with me, man. No yes, better person it was to come. Great times, great times. And it only gets greater with the intro song. It's time to learn geography. I like that little jingle. Yes, for over half a century, Somalia has gone through quite a lot of crazy stuff. But, 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 there's a lot about Somalia, and especially the Somali people, that never really gets told as well. They are descendants of the kingdom of Kush, divided into five-ish major clans and several sub-clans, each one with their own section, status, story, and specialty. So much to cover and so little time, so let's just jump into the let's code, get it. shall we? Now, here's where things are going to get a little tricky because Somalia is kind of currently in a weird state of administrative affairs when it comes to regions. Let's just say I kind of already made a video explaining this. You can watch it here, so I'm not going to go too far into it. But for what it's worth, the country of Somalia is shaped like a number seven and is located in East Africa. Not only on the section known as the Horn of Africa, but it is actually the Horn of Africa. This in return makes Somalia the country with the longest coastline in the African continent. The country is bordered by Djibouti, Ethiopia, and Kenya, as well as the Gulf of Aden and the Indian Ocean ocean to the north and east. The capital and largest city, Mogadishu, one of the fastest cities in Africa, is located in the south, and here's where things get a little complicated. When asking about Somalia's administrative divisions, it kind of depends on who you ask. If you ask someone from the Federal Republic of Somalia, they will say that the country is divided into 18 regions that look like this. If you ask someone from the north in this area, though, they might say, this area is Somaliland. We are a self-declared independent state. Our capital is Hargeisa and the second largest city. We have six regions not five. We fly our own flag. Somalia does not rule or control us. They even need to show their passports when visiting us. We do our own thing. We have our own government and president. That's interesting. Stay away from them legislatively. This is the place where Caleb and I went to meet you guys for the geography. Today, it is unrecognized by the UN and considered an autonomous region of Somalia, but many countries have informal ties to them and even accept a Somalilander passport. Then you have this guy over here on the very tip of the horn, sometimes referred to as Puntland, made up of three regions. In 1998, it declared autonomy and it kind of has its own thing too they even fly their own flag but they don't consider themselves a separate country it's complicated also there's a dispute with Somaliland over the eastern border and within that border you have another guy named Khatumo that came out and wanted to do its own thing but both of them were like shut up finally the central border with Ethiopia connecting at the tri-point with Kenya is disputed and not properly demarcated this is further complicated by the fact that this area of Ethiopia is called the Somali region and is already primarily inhabited by ethnic Somalis. In fact, ethnically speaking, many Somalis might refer to this general broad section as Greater Somalia, which includes all areas where Somalis have historically lived, extending from the southern part of Djibouti wow, that's to, interesting. Ethiopia, to East Kenya. In any case, the largest airport is Mogadishu's Aden Ade International, and if you want to include Hargeisa's Egal International, then that would be the second largest airport, and Puntland's Boaso Bender Kasim International comes in at third. Having the largest coast in Africa, of course, gives the country a maritime advantage in 
having some of the largest deep water ports in Africa, including the largest ones in Mogadishu and Kismayo in the south. And again, if you include Somaliland, Better Better Up port up in the north is the busiest on the Gulf of Aden. Whew. So, okay, why is there a separatist area and autonomous area? Again, we already explained this, but to kind of sum it up very briefly, it's like, eh, that clan warfare thing. Like, we're still family, but I'm gonna do my own thing. I have my own passport and president. And we're kind of okay with you guys having a little control over us, but we have some clans that really want to stick together and we want to run things our own way. With our own president, too. Oh, and I'm just gonna f*** everything up for you. Yeah, there's a lot more that goes into that, but long story short, this dude, Siad Barre, kind of changed the entire course of Somali history in the 21st century. To this day, the Federal Republic of Somalia only has full hold on parts of the country, whereas other parts are under Al-Shabaab. It's hard to draw an exact map on where they hold exact power because the state skirmishes occur regularly and boundaries are always shifting, but generally they stay away from the major cities and have control over certain rural areas of the country in the south. How did Al-Shabaab become a thing? Well, that's a whole other story, but to summarize, it was a group that split off from the Islamic Courts Union after it disbanded in 2006. Puntland and Somaliland are generally free from Al-Shabaab influence. Nonetheless, if you visit certain cities like Hargeisa as a tourist, you will need an armed guard to travel with you if you wow. visit anywhere outside of the city. Since the 2010s, most insurgents have died down and Somalia has been going through a slight recovery process by implementing more permanent democratic institutions, such as the new provisional constitution that was written in 2012 and a new federal government established. And with that, here are some of the top sites of Somalia. Let's Come see in. it. Feel free to ask them in the comments. All right, so we got the Mosque of Islamic Solidarity, Shanghai Old City, the Mogadishu Catholic Church, Lido Beach, the Bakara Market, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, the Black Hawk Down Crash Site Museum, yes, they made a museum based on the movie, Gezira Livestock Market, the Tomb of Sheikh Darod, the Kismayo Geledi Sultanate Ruins, Old Town Mogadishu, so many castles and fortresses like the whitewashed coral stone city of Merka or the citadel of Gondershe. If I must include the disputed self-declared unrecognized state of Somaliland, there's the ruins of the Adal Sultanate in Zela, the Bargal Ruins, the Tomb of Sheikh Isak, the Hafun Necropolis, the Ka'able Burial Sites, and Las Gil, with some of the oldest prehistoric cave paintings on the planet. It's an amazing site. I was so lucky to see it. That's not even the tip of the iceberg. Somalia has so much more to it when you see the land and meet the people. Which brings us to... Prior to Civil War times, tourism was actually quite prevalent. Despite the domestic conflict eras, the landscape and resources of Somalia have always kind of maintained its natural integrity. Here's how you break it down. For one, the Horn of Africa, which Somalia lies on, is part of the Greater Somali Plate that extends into the Indian Ocean to the east and the Great African Rift in the west. This fault zone is essentially what created the Gulf of Aden, as well as the four Yemeni islands off the coast. The passage between the Horn and these islands is known as the Garafui Channel, which connects to the subsection of the Indian Ocean, the Somali Sea. Fun fact, Within the Somali Sea, you can find the Milky Sea Night Corridor, which is the largest bioluminescent area in the world. Yeah, I've seen that. Bacteria, I've seen that. Seen from space. I'd like That's to see the, the actual land, though. First time, though. coast is mostly smooth and straight with a few islands. If you include the northern part of the disputed Somaliland area, you have the famous Sad Adin Islands, just by the border with Djibouti. Otherwise, further east, you have the mangrove islands of the famous Alula Lagoon. Inland, the country is made up of three main zones, the humid green zone in the south, the dry Somali plateau in the middle, and the dry mountainous area area in the north, mostly in the self-proclaimed state of Somaliland. Again, if you consider this part of Somalia, this area has the highest peaks of the country, known as the Ogo or Karkar Mountains, that extend all the way to the end of the Horn. Here, the tallest peak, Shimbiris, can be found in the Almado mountain range, a unique forested range that gathers more precipitation through fog, mist, and winter rains than any other that's, area. That's beautiful. The south you go, the it's a beautiful picture. a flatter plateau, like the Nugal Valley and the Mudu Plain, riddled with perennial rivers and wadis that dry up seasonally. This is known as the Haud, which has some of the best grazelands for livestock and pastoralist peoples, especially the Hobyo grasslands and shrublands along the eastern coast. This area pretty much ends at the border of the longest river of the country, Shabele, at about 702 miles long, and the more green and lush savanna and forested area of Somalia begins. The Shabele River actually in itself dries up at the ends, and only in the wet season does it continue to flow and connect with the second largest river, the Juba, in the southeast. Now, in terms of inland bodies of water, Somalia doesn't really have any major 
permanent lakes that stick out and some of you said maybe the reservoir off the Chevelle River but the majority of you guys have said the closest thing to a lake might be the Balkad Nature Reserve which is more like a massive wetland with seasonal expanse fluctuations. Yeah most of the Somalia you see in the media is just you know the dry dusty parts but no they got water and lush vegetation in some spots. All right and this is the part where Noah usually comes in to fill in but he's visiting family for this season so I'll fill in for Noah. It's hard to get numbers because without an effective centralized national government. Noah is always visiting the family. The population working as nomadic <laughs> or semi-nomadic pastoralists. Much of the booking is unavailable and many taxes and duties are carried out by various insurgent groups rather than the state. Nonetheless, in the 2010s, economic reforms began and in 2020, the IMF, World Bank, and HIPC have decided that they are qualified for debt relief. Today, about 40% of families are dependent on remittance money sent from families abroad, accounting for about $1.5 billion annually to their GDP. Wow. Not a family outside of Africa. Still, for one, they are the largest producer of frankincense, a tree gum resin used in incense of of course, but it also has many other uses. Fun fact, almost all of the Catholic Church's stock of frankincense comes from Somalia. Oh, faith economics. interesting. And finally, they are currently number one in both camel livestock population with over 7 million, and of course, camel milk production, because they have the most camels. And speaking of camels, here's our resident animal correspondent, Gary Harlow, to explain. Oh, the country has about six main national parks. Camels both originated and were first domesticated here, and today about 35% of all the camels in the world are found in the Horn of Africa, mostly in Somalia. Altogether, over 720 species of birds live here, over 170 mammals and thousands of plants and trees, especially shrubs like jasmine, poinsettia, caraway, cardamom, and trees like myrrh. Poinsettias. They have their own Somali versions of ostriches, leopards and three gerbils and two shrew species that are endemic to only Somalia. There's about 230 species of reptiles in the country. The Nile crocodile finds its home in many of the riverbeds. There's tons of fish and coral species along the coast. The most commonly caught being the Indian Ocean tuna. And speaking of tuna, there's a nice restaurant that serves up the catch of the day in Berbera. Caleb and Barb's went there and had a nice fried fish lunch with blossom. I heard it was exquisite. I for sure Gotta try some of that I'm not Caleb, and Caleb is not me, and I need to squeeze myself out of here. Thank you, Gary. And yes, speaking of fried fish on the beach, it's time to finish off this segment as we always do. Food! And you know what? Let's have a Somali do some of the explaining. Here's Sarah. Thank you, Barbs. Okay, so we're going to talk about Somali food. You'll see a unique ingredients and a touch of influence from countries like Ethiopia, Yemen, India, and even Italy. For one, we all know that coffee originated from Ethiopia, but it was actually Somalis where the first merchants of coffee. In any case, every region of Somalia has their own speciality when it comes to food, but there are some dishes you can find all over. For breakfast, anjera and yuhluha is the staple and it's enjoyed and eaten every Looks day. Like and it's either buttered with ghee and sugar or served with a plate of sukar. Another dish is bear, which is not beer but it means liver lamb and is actually liver lamb you can remember it by thinking bear affect the liver <laughs> uh, the second most popular lunch uh, enjoyed by Somalis is Somali pasto, which is an Italian inspired dish. Uh, spaghetti Ooh, is look good. Heavier stew. And Somalis always eat, eat their lunch with a cup of marak and banana. For dinner, Somali don't eat heavy. And there's one dish, Barbs, you have tried when you had. Uh, trip here in Hargeisa last year, uh, which is uh, Fasuliat Iobe Bel, and it's an egg omelette with baked beans. Can you Ooh, that that looks good. Meat consumed here. Khalid gave us camel meat. What is this, Khalid? Okay, so we have the white, which is the hub, of course, so it's like pure fat, and then we have the actual camel meat. Very squishy and fatty. <laughs> Thank you, and I hope you get the chance to try so many food. Oh yeah, I would love to. And the only thing better than Somali food are the Somali people. Let's talk about them. Let's talk about them, then, huh? Let's break some stereotypes. Why don't we let Somali geography and geography winner Ahmed explain? What it means to be Somali is to be proud of your lineage. So most Somalis I know. And most Somalis in general can go back uh, 10, 20 generations on their father's side. Oh, wow. I can go by, even for myself, I can go by six, six grandfathers just by heart. 
So I think that's a really cool thing. Thank you, Ahmed. With Somalis, there are so many levels where a person can properly identify themselves, but it all comes down to lineage. We'll get into that in a sec, but first, the demographics graph. First of all, for Somalia, the population altogether is about 15 million, but keep in mind, the self-declared independent state of Somaliland has about 3.6 million, and often does not like to be part of this statistic, so depending on how you look at these two entities, it could be 15 or 11.4 million. But for the sake of the fact that the UN does not recognize Somaliland, I will have to abide by the UN standard and include Somaliland. This also means the entire country is Africa's most culturally homogenous nation. The country is primarily made up of Somali people at about 85% of the population, but keep in mind this broad group is divided into clans. According to the UNFPA statistics, about 23% of the country is Hawiye, and another 23% are Darud, about 14% are Rahanwen, sorry, probably butchered that, and another 14% are from the Isak clan, and the remainder of the Somalis come from various other sub-clans and sub-sub-clans of these major four. The remainder of the non-Somali population, though, is mostly Bantu groups and a small percentage of Arabs that have migrated over the years. They use the Type-C plug outlet and they drive on the right side of the road. I've, I've heard about the Bantu. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was doing a lot of uh, earlier on, when I did the Somali reactions, uh, a few people who were Bantu actually commented on there and actually watched the video about the Bantu people and it said that uh, they have influences even in South America in the in the, in the people there, uh, which is kind of cool. But uh, apparently the Bantu is like a major uh, tribe, yeah, I don't know if to call them a tribe or a section of people across Africa. Mostly, however, in Somaliland, about 90% of the cars have steering wheels on the right side, but they drive on the right side. That's pretty interesting. I didn't know that. They use the Somali shilling as their currency. However, in Somaliland, they use Somaliland shillings, which look like this. Keep in mind, though, most Somalis, like somewhere around three quarters of the entire population, both in Somalia and Somaliland, actually prefer to pay through their phones with various money apps like Zad and Idahab. This, interestingly enough, makes Somalia as a categorically underdeveloped nation, but one of the most tech finance adapt nations on earth. Obviously, the main first and nice. the language of Somalia is Somali, a Cushitic language. But Arabic is also co-official. Many Somalis learn and speak it, and they're even part of the Arab League. But do not, I repeat, do not call Somalis Arabs. They don't like it. I heard you guys loud and clear in the past. The Somali language has adapted the Latin alphabet in the 70s. However, from the 20s and 30s and 50s, three guys tried to invent Somali scripts that looked pretty cool, but never really caught on. Also, keep in mind the southern and eastern parts of Somalia were colonized by Italy for about 50 years. Today, however, very few people actually still speak Italian or bother to learn it, but they still love pasta. In other news, Islam is the state religion, specifically Sunni Islam. Noticeable branches like Sufis exist too. Their government is even an admixture of civil, customary, and Islamic law. And they are actually one of the oldest Islamic nations on earth, like they have a 1,400-year-old mosque in the city of Zela. Now, as mentioned, most Somali people are very serious with their ancestry when it comes to identity, and much of it is centered around the clan that they are part of, a concept known as Ud Hashai. I think we got that right. They are Kushitic, a unique group indigenous to East Africa, claiming to have roots to the ancient kingdom of Kush that extended all the way to ancient Nubia in what is now Egypt. They claim to be descendants of Kush, the grandson of Noah in the Bible. Many of them can trace their ancestors as far back as 20 to 30 generations, all going back to the same patriarch, Somale, which is where the country gets its name from. And speaking of clans, their own government has a controversial system referred to as the 4.5 system, in which the four main clans, Dir, Darod, Hawile, and uh, Rahanwen, and the point five standing for the minor clans, they're all required to have proportional representation in parliament. Now, historically, there is too much to cover, but Somalia has had so many empires, kingdoms, and sultanates that go through their history. Now, we're not going to sugarcoat this episode too much. Yes, when most people hear of Somalia, two stereotypes kind of immediately go through their heads. Pirates and Al-Shabaab. Somalis are kind of sick of hearing this, but yes, to some extent, the two groups are still somewhat active. Al-Shabaab is an internationally recognized terrorist jihadist organization started in 2000 and has claimed responsibility for numerous attacks, mostly in East Africa. In 2014, drone strikes killed an important leader and have pushed insurgents outside most major cities. As for the pirate thing, it's a little more complex than most media outlets portray it. First of all, most Somalis kind of hate the fact that these pirates have kind of given their country a bad reputation and disavow their actions. Nonetheless, basically after the second phase of the civil war in the early 2000s, Somalia, with its decentralized rule and informal state of operation, disbanded the navy and lacked a national coast guard, which prompted many foreign 
foreign ships passing by to be like, Hey, Somalia is so unorganized, they can't even secure their own waters. Let's take a bunch of their fish. Or we could just dump a bunch of waste in their water and destroy their fish. Either way, they won't notice. To which coastal Somalis were like, Uh, we do notice and no. Yeah, it pissed off a lot of people, and in response, fishing communities formed armed groups to deter invaders, but then it turned real south and evolved into a lucrative criminal operation, hijacking vessels, even outside. Stop it off as a good thing. So, in essence, to protect Trump oneself. Made a substantially worse wrong. Nonetheless, it's pretty much non-existent now. The International Task Force 150 Coalition substantially deterred most acts of piracy off the Horn of Africa, and today it's pretty rare to see large-scale attacks. Today, Somalis are trying to make a recovery, and one of the ways they do that is through sports. And with that, it is time for the sports part with Art. Come on, Art! Hello. What does athletic recreation look like for Somalia? Well, you'd be surprised, and it's quite alive and well. Fun fact, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, which I have some of his sports cards actually, coached the Somali national basketball team back in the 80s, helping them jump to the top three teams in Africa. They have a few accolades in the martial arts department. They took home a silver medal in fourth place in the 2013 Open World Taekwondo Challenge Cup. And this dude right here, won the world and European titles in K1 and Thai boxing. If you talk to any Somali, pretty much everyone... Mohamed Farah. Mohamed Farah. The Somali Brit is the most successful long-distance runner and track athlete in British Olympic history. Nonetheless, Abdi Bile is the most decorated national athlete. He holds numerous national track records. And finally, really weird and interesting fact, Somalia is currently the only country in Africa with the national bandy team. So, Art, what is is bandy oh my god barbs i am so happy that you asked bandy is basically hockey but played with a ball and the goalkeepers have no sticks most of the national players for somalia are actually swedish somalis that practice in sweden as somalia oh. doesn't really have any ice skating rinks or even snow for that matter all right guys so i'm gonna go eat some meatloaf not to Vanya! thank you art yeah skating swedish somalis somalis have made quite an international presence. I mean, they've had a lot of explorers like these guys, one of which became the ruler of the Maldives. But let's let random Hannah explain a little bit more in the culture segment. Bring it on, it's Hannah. Good to be back, guys. And it's good to know you can now get a random Hannah t-shirt at geographynow.com. Just saying, don't get a Keith shirt. Anyway, with Somalia, <laughs> the family is the cornerstone of culture. In fact, in marriage, women do not change their names and retain their forefather's title. When the baby is born, it is customary for the mother and child to remain indoors for a period of 40 days. This is known as Afantamba. Somalis are loaded with traditional folklore. It even lives within an entire tribe, the mystical Ibir people. They are a minority clan that are supposedly descendants from a magician that was killed by a famous sheik. According to this myth, many people in Somalia society pay a small gift of money to Ibir families whenever a child is born as a form of blood compensation and to avoid being cursed. Oh, wow. A money maker, oh, like, like from birth. you have mystical characters like Deg Deer, a cannibalistic old woman who runs super fast when she hears bad children from miles away. Great bedtime story. Most Somali homes come equipped with dab cards, a white clay or soapstone pot used as an incense burner. For clothing, it's not uncommon to still see men wearing traditional ma'awis or makawis and a kufiyad on the head in public. As for women, in day-to-day -day life, most will wear a hijab in public. However, the the traditional guntino, which almost looks like an Indian sari, is commonly worn. On formal occasions, you might see a jarak, a more colorful pattern dress. Interesting enough, Somalia is one of the top supermodel producing countries in Africa. David Bowie's wife, Iman, was one of them. One of the most expensive African movies ever made, The Somalia Dervish, was released in 1985, highlighting many historical events. And they have a huge celebration on Independence Day on July 1st. However, people in the north Northern self-declared state of Somaliland make a bigger deal of May 18th. And that's a whole nother discussion we are not exactly qualified to facilitate, so... But one thing we are going to discuss is music, facilitated by Keith. Don't buy his shirt on geographynow.com, buy mine. Mine is better. Hannah, your shirt sucks. <laughs> Whee! 
All right, so Somali people have a rich musical heritage centered on traditional Somali folklore. Many of their songs use the pentatonic scale and they harmonize it, and they only use five pitches per octave, which that is what a pentatonic scale is, and <laughs> penta meaning five, math. There are many different styles of traditional dance. However, a popular one might be the danto, which is done all over the Horn of Africa. It includes both men and women usually in parallel line patterns with lots of stationary knee bending and front to back arm swing. Thumbs up. There are so many famous Somali musicians like these dudes right here. Many of them are widely known in Somalia. Somalis abroad have become famous, famous like these people. Did I write famous twice? Yeah, you did. Oh shoot, sorry. I'm gonna say famous, famous. <laughs> and finally, fun fact, in Mogadishu, there was a Somali version of disco in the 70s that was super popular known as Moga Disco. That's it for me. <laughs> Moga I'm Disco. Would you rather wear Hannah around or some beautiful, sexy stallion man that looks like a lion? Thank you, Keith. Now, for famous people, there are so many famous people that you guys emailed me about. Here is a montage. I can't even mention all of them. It'll take way too long. And if there are any more, please write them in the comments. In any case, we gotta move on. So, the final segment, the friend zone. All right. So I'm all glad this person suggested this. Now, we already mentioned a lot of countries already have a lot of Somali people besides Somalia. So from their inception, Somalia has kind of already had a lot of outreach. First of all, in the West, the USA and UK have the largest Somali diaspora communities, most from the northern disputed Somaliland region, as it was a former British colony and English is more prevalently spoken amongst them. After the civil war in the 90s, the majority of Somali refugees fled to these countries and specifically the heaviest concentration in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Today though, many of these immigrants are actually returning back and repatriating, bringing their education, skills, and money to build up their mother Repatriation Russia, time. Too. Back when they were in the USSR, they became the first European country to sign a friendship treaty, which allowed thousands of soldiers to study and train in Russia, while USSR cosmonauts trained in Somalia to prepare for missions in space. Yemen and Turkey are probably the closest non-African countries. For Yemen, not only have they had so much history of trade and cultural relations that date back thousands of years, but even today, they usually back each other up during any kind of domestic conflict. When both countries had civil wars, each one welcomed refugees, and today, Yemen actually has the highest population of Somalis in diaspora than any other country outside of Africa. Oh, so he not wow. only also took in many Somali refugees, but also helped tremendously during the Civil War. They are one of the top business partners, and even though it's a little controversial, they are one of the few countries that has an actual embassy in the self-declared unrecognized state of Somaliland. When it comes to their closest friends, it really depends on who you ask, and it's not a simple answer. You would think it would be the countries within the greater Somalia region, like Ethiopia, Kenya, and Djibouti, but it's a little more complicated. See, Kenya, which has a highest Somali population in the north has had a bit of tension historically, everything from the Shifta War in the 1960s to the 2011 Al-Shabaab insurgent attack, Ethiopia, which has the highest population of Somalis outside of the Republic of Somalia at about 4.6 million, has also had a bit of controversy with everything from the Abyssinian conquest from this dude back in the Middle Ages to the Ogaden War of the 1970s and so on, and also, you know, it didn't really quite help that Somalia assisted Eritrea during their war of independence against Ethiopia, but... Yeah. Out of all of them, Djibouti, with about 60% of their population being Somali, kind of seems to be the only country with a Somali population that keeps it chill with Somalia. Djibouti is sometimes even called French Somalia, as it was a former French colony. In the end, though, today, relations are relatively good with all these countries, and when a Somali meets another Somali, regardless of where they come from, there's an instant connection, and often they kind of use their family that live within these countries to get passports, as the Somali passport isn't very powerful. But hey, family helps family, right? In conclusion, Somalis are a very unique people. It's like when they meet each other, there's an instant spark, you're Somali, but then there's like an intense interrogation about lineage and clan affiliation, and then it's like, ah, you're Somali, let's go grab a beer. And with that, stay tuned, South Africa is coming up next. Wow, that was a, that was a lot of information, but it's kind of cool, uh to learn about these places because you know in this part of the world all you see is the uh, the pirates and uh, and and you know the starving and the civil war it's like if a country has like an african country or total country have a war they are automatically identified by that and it sticks for years and years and years you know what i mean sometimes centuries you know so it's good to know that 
and that's why I'm, I always tell people when you travel, travel, talk to the people. Now, you, you, everywhere you go, there's going to be bad places. There's, there's just no two ways about it. Wherever you go, there's going to be bad places. You just have to be careful and have the instinct to figure out who have bad intentions towards you. I mean, I'm, I'm an immigrant. So, you know, I've learned to figure out who's got bad intentions for me and stay away from them. And there is, unfortunately, it's a minority of people. Because if it wasn't, I wouldn't feel safe. Or anybody who goes to a different culture wouldn't feel safe. But, you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's, it's cool to see that things are a little bit better or a lot better. And that they start to move ahead and move forward. And uh, thank you, Geography Now. Comment down below. Let me know what you all think. I know I have a lot of uh, Somali uh, uh, subscribers. Comment down below. Drop some more information on me. Tell me the cool stuff about where you're from, you know. Uh, hit me up with some more. The food, the dig, you know, that, that kind of stuff I'm interested in. But... Uh, Thank you all for watching this with me and I hope you all learn a little something new about uh, Somali, the Republic of Somali, Somaliland, Punt, whatever it is. Uh, you know what I mean? Respect them people and new people respect out the, out other, other people from the outside. You understand what I say? Listen guys, I ain't going to babble on too much. You all take care of each other, alright? Cool runnings.